Good morning, Oakview family. How's everybody doing today? We are here and we are excited to start the service today with a few baptisms because it is my favorite way to start a service. Um, what we have here is Jalen. He, uh, he made a decision to follow and accept Christ into his heart at camp this year and, and we've been working through it and it has been one of the best times of my life and, and for him too, I know. Jalen, have you accepted uh, Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. In obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in Him, I baptize you, my brother Jalen, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a new kind of life. Okay, aren't you glad we have more? Yeah. Amen. When, uh, when I married Charlotte two years ago, I inherited an immediate family of two beautiful children and five grandchildren. And uh, it is an honor to be able to baptize three of those grandchildren today. This is, this is Bailey. She is one of the 2020 graduates that has endured such a difficult year in her high school graduation year, but she has said numerous times that she used a lot of this time to be able to draw closer to God, and uh, that's just a beautiful testimony. And so I ask, uh, as Jack did, Bailey, I ask you if you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Yes, I have. All right. <laughs> we make that loud and clear? Okay, turn. In obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in Him, I baptize you, my sister Bailey, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in, buried in the Holy Spirit of Christ, raised to walk in the newness of life. We have a couple more coming real quick. <laughs> Come on down, AJ. You make it? Yep. All right. Here we have, have AJ, AJ Romo. AJ told me one Sunday after, after lunch, after we'd finished praying over a meal, that he wanted Jesus to come into his heart. So... Uh, there's nothing sweeter to hear. So, AJ, I just want to ask you if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Yes, I have. All right. <laughs> Let me get you to turn this way, my man. Ow. Oh. <laughs> in obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in Him, I baptize you, my brother AJ, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism. And raised to walk in a new kind of life. <laughs> Guys, it doesn't get any better than being able to do this with, with grandchildren or children. Now we have eight year old Max. Your class is cheering for you in the whole church, is Max. Yeah, I was just so thrilled when Max asked if I'd be the one to, to do the baptism, and, and, and I'm happy to. I love you, and uh, just want to ask you, Max, if you've accepted Jesus as your yes. Lord and Savior. Yes, I have. Yes, he has. So, again, in obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my brother Max, in the name of the Father and the Son. Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Let's stand again this morning. So good to see 
Father, for defeating sin and death. Father, thank you for rolling away that stone and leaving an empty tomb for us. You chase us. You pursue us. You are unwilling to leave us alone. Thank you, Father, for the way that you save young and old.
thank you, Father, for making yourself known, for revealing yourself, for tearing down the veil, that we have an opportunity to step into the Holy of Holies. Because of you and your great love for us, you decided to make a change. Thank you for making that change, for giving us an opportunity to approach you, your throne of grace, with confidence and boldness. Thank you. We stand in awe this morning. We stand and we see, we reflect. Again, we remember who you are and what you've done. Father, that we would stand in awe now, even as we sit, that we would stand in our minds and our hearts, Lord, in greater appreciation for you and your scriptures, for what you have asked of us, Lord. Father, continue to stir in our hearts as we look into your word now. You are worth it. Elizabeth's got a fan section up front. Yeah, all right. Isn't that exciting about these baptisms? Amen? All right, what a great day. This is our, we had five baptisms today, and we had uh, Mary Garcia was baptized in the first service. And so uh, we've got a couple more in a couple weeks. So we're, this has been a great time. October's going to be an amazing month, and I pray that'll be true for your family as well as our church family. Uh, if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 21, or you can follow along in your outline or the screens, uh, we want to uh, welcome you to uh, this new series uh, called Prophecies, Mysteries, and Heresies, and that covers all the bases, and we'll, being able to sort those three things out are essential, and we'll talk about that here in a, in a, in a little bit, Luke chapter 21. Um, before I jump into the message, let me just say a word to you uh, about uh, this Wednesday night. We're going to be opening up. I'm going to be starting back our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, some of you might be looking for a Bible study. We'll meet in the two-story tan building over here at 6 o'clock. Uh, we don't go long because uh, we, we make it a quick thing. So 6 from about 6, 6.30, 6.35. We'll do a prayer time together around the tables and a Bible study. And I hope you'll, you'll come and be a part of that if you can. We'll also be online. And so if you're, if you're not getting the daily devotional, just uh, email me, jim at obbc.net. Or call the office and the instructions you can get on the zoom call if you can't come uh, that early or you know maybe you're just getting back you can you can join us by uh, on zoom online that'd be what it'd be great as well so Luke chapter 21 let me tell you a little bit as we launch this series this is a passage of scripture that Jesus teaches it's called the Olivet Discourse and that's just because it was given at the Mount of Olives and some of you have been how many of you have been to the Holy Land we've some of you I know we have and seen some of those pictures uh, what a wonderful opportunity that was for you. But I've seen those pictures, and the Mount of Olives is right adjacent to the old part of Jerusalem, just east of, of uh, Jerusalem. And so Jesus gives this teaching, this discourse uh, on the end times. And so we'll get to that, that message here in a moment. But, you know, this one thing I want to ask you to do about this series, and so I, I hope you'll um, be, not only be here for all these parts of it, we're either going to go three or four, depending on kind of how the Spirit leads, uh, three or four parts to this, three or four weeks. I invite you, encourage you to invite friends. If you're watching online, I hope you'll pass the link on to this video to other folks. And, and Because I do think there's not just great interest, but there's great importance to this, this theme of this series. And so in this theory, series, the theme or the, the big idea is that we as believers have to think biblically. We have to be able to sort out truth from error, what is, what, is um, what things we can know, what things we can't ever know because of the greatness and the mystery of God. So there are, there are prophecies that we can know about the future. There are mysteries that are bigger and greater than our capacity to ever fathom. And I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for mysteries. You know, <laughs> you know, if I could figure everything out, there wouldn't be the incredible awesomeness of God. I mean, he, he thinks up things that are so beyond me to, to understand. But there are clear things he's told us about the future that we can know. There are things that we can't no, because of our limited ability. And then there are some things that we are never to believe in. They're called heresies. And so there are people teaching things that are partly true or all, all uh, are, are completely false. 
and sort of sort out these things, what things are true and not. So this is, this is the heart of the series. This is what we're trying to equip. And, and I hope you'll let me kind of, you know, kind of walk through this with you. Many of you, you know, have been down this road, and, and you won't understand the importance of being able to think biblically and sort through questions. And when you get news and information and some, some new kind of thing that somebody tells you, can, you, can you think it through and put it up against Scripture and process that information? Uh, that's what this series is going to help us do, I hope, in these days ahead. Now, there's a couple things I want to say to you just about as we kind of kick off this series, I mean, this, this message with this series, I mean, this series with this message. And that is the title of the message is COVID Crisis and the Signs of the End Times. And, and so um, it sounds like a book I'm trying to sell online or something, I know. But this is a topic that is in a lot of people's minds right now. Uh, in fact, if you want to buy the book, it'll be in the foyer after the service. It's $50. No, I'm kidding. It's not going to, there's no, there's another so. Um, but what, what, there is a question people are asking, and it's, it really peaked in March and April, but people are still thinking about this. Uh, I know things that, you know, the curve is flattened, but even so, the, 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 there has been this sort of apocalyptic feel about the world we're in. We can't get the images out of our mind of some of the things that happened back then, and in, in some cases are still happening now. You know, schools are closed, businesses are shuttered, uh, people are told to shelter in place. You know, stores are empty of things that you want to try to buy. People are lining up for things that we take for granted. You know, there, you see pictures, I still remember images of seeing, you know, uh, Times Square with nobody in it, which never happens, and just see de- you know, kind of this desolation, barrenness around the world. And you kind of begin to think, this feels like some movie. In fact, it's bigger than something that a person could come up with that this would happen all around the world at the same time. And yet it did, and we lived through it. And we think about what does that mean, and where does that place us in this whole grand scheme of God's plan? So here's what I think people are asking. Is there a connection between COVID-19 and the end times? I think that's a good question. Are we living in the last days before the return of Christ? And then another way some people I hear say, talk about is, is the coronavirus a sign that we are in the end times? So this message is really an answer to those questions. But, well, let's do this. Let's start out by defining what a prophetic sign is. Because prophetic signs, there are signs of, of the deity of Christ. There are signs of, of the, the veracity of the truthfulness of Scripture. But there are prophetic signs in the Bible. And this is what we're talking about today when we talk about signs. An, a, a prophetic sign is an event, a place, or a person. Now, broaden your thoughts here because it could be a, a thing that happens it could be a place where it happens or even a person that is a part of this that leads to or whose existence indicates something important in God's plan for the future. So God's got this plan for the future and it's, he's got it all in his, you know, he's got it all figured out. He's sovereign and no matter what's happening, that plan will eventually come to pass even though he gives us a lot of freedom in this world and people to do a lot of things against his will. Ultimately, his will will, be, will happen and so that's the plan for his future. But he gives us signs about when those kinds of things are happening for really just to help us. You know, we, we like to have signs. I don't know about you, but if I'm going somewhere, I want signs. I want someone to show me when to go or where to turn or when I'm there or when I'm close. That helps. And so this is what he's doing with these signs for us. Now, signs are not meant to be a definitive picture so we don't have to trust God. Do you, you, you understand that? I mean, one of the problems with Google, okay, is it gives us signs of where to turn and when to turn. Have you ever been taken down a place you didn't want to go to by Google, okay, amen? And you think, I need to know enough about where I'm going that I don't, I I remember one time it took me a place uh, that could have been a real problem for me, actually, where where I went. And and I thought to myself, well, I was just following, and, and, you know, these signs with, you know, these weren't, I don't think, the ones that were intended for me to receive, but it's the ones I got. So you've got to be able to test the signs as well. But God's signs, prophetic signs from God, are, this is what they are, okay? You got, so look at uh, Luke chapter 21. At the end of that passage, I'm going to go from the back, end of the passage back up to the, to the front, okay? So we're going to kind of go in reverse. The end of the passage, there's a parable, a very short parable that Jesus teaches or, or, or gives us that teaches an important truth about the end times, about signs, okay? So he says this, beginning there in verse 29, he says, He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. Okay, he's basically just saying, look at all trees. Now, back, just so you'll know, fig trees, they sprout in, in summer and then they bear fruit. Okay, and so everybody wants to know when the fruit's coming on the fig tree. So he says, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. So, you know, you got this spring kind of 
in late spring kind of sprouting of leaves. So you know that, that there, the summer is near because that's the same season. It happens over and over. And then you know that fruit is after that. And so you kind of kind of get a, a little bit of a timeline of the immediacy of the fruitfulness of the fig tree. Even so, when you see these things happening, he's referring to these signs that we're going to talk about that are in the earlier verses. When you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God, remember that is? That's when God's will is perfectly done. We pray the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, knowing that in this world it's not perfectly done. But one day his kingdom will come to this earth. This earth will end as we know it. And this thing called the kingdom age, or the age where God's reign begins. And there's a lot, we, you know, we, we could talk a lot about the, you know, the, the coming, the rapture, and the tribulation, and, the, and the, the millennial kingdom, and then this forever king, new heaven and new earth. But what, just know this, there will come a day when the kingdom will fully come. And this is what he's talking about. The kingdom is near when these things are happening. Now, then he gets into, and by the way, I want to just, one, there are three passages that parallel each other in this Olivet Discourse. There's Mark chapter 13. Have you noticed in, in the Gospels, the same event is covered. It's like a news reporter would cover a story, three different reporters. Uh, Mark records this teaching of Jesus, and he taught lots of things over lots of times, he repeated himself over and over. And so they caught different things, very similar messages, and so also in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. All three are the same teaching of Jesus on the Mount of Olives, the Olivet, Olivet Discourse. But Matthew picks up on one thing that, that wasn't recorded by Luke, and he says this, and I'll just read it to you, Matthew 24, verse 8. He says, all these things, again, after he gives the signs that I'm about to give to you, he says this, all these are the beginning of labor pains. Now, you think about what he meant by that. That's a, that's a pretty fascinating little statement. Jesus said, here's some signs that to look for with my return, and all these things are the beginnings of of labor pains. Now, the big event's the birth, right? So, it, it, labor pains come before the birth, right? So, when I remember when Matthew was born, our first, our oldest, our firstborn, and for whatever reason, Matthew, the, the labor was a long, went along for a long time. It was just grueling how much we suffered during that labor. Okay, all right. The moms are going to kill me. Okay, how much she suffered and I watched, okay? And it went for a long time. And here's what happens with labor pains. You start with the first labor pain, you know things are about to get ready. So you get serious. You pack up and you go. Then when the, what happens with labor pains is they get closer together and they get more intense over time. And this is what he's saying is happens with these signs that we're about to talk about. You're going to see some of them and then they're going to get more frequent and then more intense. Intensity and frequency are going to increase. That's what he's, what he's saying. So two things happen. One thing follows the next, which follows the next. There's a linear side to this and then there is a frequency that increases and, and the repetition and, and the uh, intensity increases so gives you kind of a backdrop so let's look at these six signs that are in Luke chapter 21 these aren't the only signs but these are good indicators of what we ought to be knowing and seeing when when the end comes so are we in the end times I'm going to tell you right up front I can't tell you for I'm not, I, nobody will know as we'll read earlier but we can know this that that there is a warning going on. There is an awareness. There, is, there are birth pains happening, okay? And, and you can say, how far are they apart? And how intense are they? And when's the birth going to happen? And when's the new kingdom coming? I, I, can't, I couldn't tell you that with Matthew. I can't tell you that with this. But I can tell you their signs. So here's what it says. They came to, to him with a question. We come to, to Christ with our question. Here's what a disciple says. They said, teacher. And he's talking about signs and the coming event. The temple's going to get torn down, which it did in 70 A.D. So some things happen immediately. And then he says, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they're about to take place? In other words, we kind of, like, we, we kind of want to know, right? We want a warning. We want to be ready or be prepared. And, and so Jesus has this, love, he gives signs, but he'll come right back and talk about how signs should never take the place of faith. So some people want signs to take the place of faith. I don't have to believe if I know when everything's going to happen because I can just sort of, I'll, I'll fix it or I'll, I'll be ready for it or I'll, uh, I won't have to trust him because I already know. So that's not what he wants to do, but he says they ask the question. So here's the six he gives. Number one is this. Look at verse 8. Verse 8, he says this. He replied, watch out uh, that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. Um, the first one here is false teachers and leaders, and there will be and have been. If you know much about the intensity and the frequency of false leaders, you know there's more now than ever before, okay? Just, just scan the Internet. There have been cults and groups 
there have been, there are literally hundreds of groups that have either some truth or 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 or, or, or are all false, uh, but they're out there. And so, this is an important sign of it. Realize uh, number two, our second one here, is found in in verse nine and it's verse ten. It says warfare among the nations. So, of course. Thousands of wars going on uh, in it any one in time, but he says when you hear of wars and uprisings, I think the King James says rumors of wars, um, do not be frightened. And, and again, Jesus is going to keep saying this, don't, you know, don't follow the false leaders, don't be frightened about the wars. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. A day is as a thousand years to the Lord, so in the God's perspective, it's been two days since the resurrection. And so he's saying there's going to be a lot of wars in, in those 2,000 years, but just realize that that's just going to, and they're going to increase in frequency and intensity over time. Here's the third, uh, the next one. Uh, there will be increase in famines, earthquakes, and plagues. And I would just say this to you in terms of where we stand, there have been, this has been, been true, although there have always been a lot of earthquakes, famines, and plagues. Uh, verse 11, there will be great earthquakes, famines, and this is the word uh, that I should have underlined, and you'll underline there in your notes, and pestilences, okay? The dictionary defines a pestilence as a fatal epidemic. And, of course, we understand COVID is a fatal pandemic. So there will be famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. So let me just pause for a moment and say this. Um, these pestilences historically have occurred, two that just are, are, are epic, and one of them occurred in the middle 1300s. It was called the bubonic plague. It killed about, and this is just hard to even imagine, uh, 200 million people when the population was just a fraction of what it is now. Uh, half of Europe died in the, what they call the Black Death. And so that happened in the middle 1300s. Then in 1918, there's the Spanish flu, which you've heard about, killed 40 to 50 million people. And so you might say, well, those were much worse than what's going on now. But just keep in mind now the frequency of these kind of viral things that we've never heard of. These, those are hundred year, hundreds of years apart. There is a frequency of, in the last 40 or 50 years, these, these new strains of animal to human past viruses continue to increase. So where does COVID-19 fit into this? Obviously, it's a pestilence, okay? It's, it's this area of pandemic, it's fatal, and it's, um, it's, it creates a, a pathway of, of terrible pathway of death, even though we have lots of things that are being thrown against it right now, and we have a lot of access to things that we don't, didn't, they didn't have years ago. But keep in mind about this, that uh, believers for hundreds of years have always believed that Christ would come back eminently or soon. That's just the way they lived their lives. They had an expectation. And so when they saw these things happening, of course, they felt like it was their generation, right? When they saw, I'm sure back in the 1300s, they thought, well, this is the end of the world. I mean, this is, this is going to happen uh, in my lifetime or in, in our lifetime. And so here's, here's what we have to look at is that, again, we're looking to the next great event in the calendar of God's timing and to be able to know when it is all we can say is this COVID-19 fits this okay it fits this increasing in frequency and then in some ways the transmission of it is the is the ability for a virus now to go across around the world so quickly because of the uh, how connected we are globally let me just do one t I do want to say one thing about COVID-19 what's unique about COVID-19 it is there we've never had a virus that was post-internet world, post-globally connected internet world. In other words, there is this sense in which we are more globally connected where one event in one uh, city or, or one community or even one family can then become spread around the world instantaneously. Seven billion people, or I'd say more like five out of the seven billion people are connected to that information immediately. And so even though there may not be actual uh, there, there, there won't be maybe the actual numbers of people. There will be the perception of the intensity can create reactions. And I, and I will say this to you, and, I'll, and I, won't go any, I won't go off on this uh, to a side note because I won't chase this rabbit. But this is what happens. We, we've never lived in such an in, interconnected world. Uh, we've never seen government take such widespread control over our lives so quickly. And they have, this has set the stage for how future crises will be handled and how future leaders will gain and keep power. 
So just plant that thought. That's another reason why this is a unique idea. So here's the next one, okay? We got increase in dams, earthquakes. The next sign is persecution of Christians, uh, Christ followers. But before all of this, again, he's saying this is a pre-pre-event, but before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues. They will put you in prison. Uh, you'll be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. Naming the name of Christ will have a price. Naming the name of Christ will have a price in the future. It has that now in many places in the world. So don't stop naming the name of Christ, okay? But, but know that this is a part of what's going to happen in the days uh, ahead, and especially in end times. Look at the next one then. Because the next one follows. There will also be a falling away of some believers. In fact, um, depending on which translation you have, it will say many believers. Uh, some people believe it will be most believers that will fall away. Because they're, they're going to be, the, the temperature is going to rise, and they're going to say, I'm out. You know, I, I didn't sign up for anything hard. I, I, I wanted the easy stuff. I don't want anything that's going to cost me anything. So here's what it says in Matthew. It says, sin will be rampant everywhere in, the, in these last days, and the love of many will grow cold. There will be a coldness for, for the things of the Lord, a coldness for other believers. And then, of course, um, this, uh, let's go back to that last slide for just a second, if we could. And then 1 Timothy 4.1. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly, Paul says, that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. Now, remember earlier, false teachers, some will go follow after a leader who tells them what they want to hear. And there will be some, some leaders who will come on the scene that are going to have some very impressive sort of things that will happen. And we know one of those is the Antichrist, and that's a whole other message. But there will be people who follow leaders who will have solutions in, in ways that will be partially truthful, and then there will be a time when they will depart from uh, Christ or anything that honors him. And so they will turn away from the true faith, and some will just give up altogether. They'll just say, I'm, I'm, I'm out. Uh, they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that will come from demons. Ultimately, there's a father of lies, and we know that that's what... <laughs> The Bible talks about in um, it talks about the the, the the enemy or the accuser, the devil, is the father of lies. All right, here's the last one. Here is um, this, the, 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 up to now these have all been negative, and you're probably going, "Wow, this is kind of depressing," you know. Well, there there is some really good news here that something that's going to happen before Christ comes back is the spread of the gospel around the world. Isn't that exciting? Are you excited about that? Amen. We talked about that last week. We, we, we take, it's hard to have this wonderful meal that satisfies our soul and know that there are others who are starving to death out there. And yet we know that just like there's these warnings and these signs, I don't think you can live on this planet right now and not feel this sense that maybe something's up and maybe I need to think about doing something because there may be some end to this. And it uh, seems like there's just a, awareness. But this is something that will happen. Not only is there a warning of things come, to come, but there's going to be an opportunity to respond to Christ. So it says in Matthew 24, remember, this is the parallel passage in Matthew. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so, so that um, all nations will hear it. And that, that can be translated people groups. Uh, that can be translated uh, heart language. There are 6,000 languages in the, in the world right now. The Bible or parts of it have been translated into 4,000 of those, and the number is increasing. I'm not sure you have to have it all translated for this prophecy to come true. I'm just saying there is a huge movement among our missionary families, and, you know, we've got the Jollies in Spain. We've got other, there, there are 5,000 international missionaries that we have around the world that we support, but, but, but there are just thousands of organizations who are committed to this verse bringing it to pass. But this is one of the things that's going to happen. Everybody's going to get a chance. They're going to hear. And I'll tell you one thing that's really exciting is that technology that creates some problems for us also creates some solutions for us and that people in closed countries that could never hear the gospel otherwise are hearing the gospel through Internet and through uh, TV and broadcasts into countries that were formerly completely closed, closed the gospel. So let me do this. I'm going to, I'm going to walk through this fairly quickly. But and we've gone, we're going through lots of scripture here. But here's, here's the, the turn, because the signs of the times, and we could interpret each one of these and say, well, this one has been met 80%, this one is 70%, or, or whatever, but the importance of what Jesus taught was this. He was concerned about our hearts, okay? He, he's like, where's your heart? How's your heart? Because he knew that's, the real mat that's what's really important. Where's your heart, and how's your heart, and how's it doing? And so I want to give you four things that were in the ministry of Jesus that he was concerned about 
that he would want us to know as we go through these uncertain times. These are, these are essentials, and you've heard these echoed in past weeks, but I just want to let you know these are so, so important to how we respond to these uncertain times. First one is simply this, if you're taking some notes. There's a continued emphasis in Scripture that we are, we are to conquer fear through faith. And I just want to say this to you about conquering. I don't mean by that that we do away with obliterate or, you know, vanquish fear. We're talking about conquering, meaning to be able to move ahead in spite of our fears. What the enemy wants us to do is stop, be paralyzed spiritually, and not move ahead as a church, as believers, as a Christian family. To not make plans for the kingdom, to not, to not try to push, to, to continue to grow the kingdom, to not pray that thy kingdom come, thy will be done but rather to stop and to look around and to be immobilized. And so faith is what breaks through that. And to know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not going to leave us or forsake us. He's there for us. And so, you know, we've been, I tell you, if COVID's done nothing else, and it's done a lot more, but it has reminded us of how fragile life is. It's reminded us of the uncertainty. You can't guarantee, there are no guarantees about tomorrow. And it, ca- it ought to cause us to try to say, you know, the one thing I can count on in the midst of all this is my relationship, my faith in Jesus that will not be, it cannot be changed. So here's the kind of things Jesus said in these teachings. And if you read back through them, and I encourage you to do that, note how many times Jesus would come back and say, well, here's some things you should know, but how is your heart? Because I care about your heart. I care about your being. So he says things like, fear not, trust me, place your faith in me. I'm greater than anything. Greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Keep looking up. That's where your redemption, your power comes from. Not physically, but the idea that's above you and beyond your own. I will never leave you alone. I won't give up on you. I will give you peace. Uh, the peace I leave you is not the kind of world, the peace that the world gives you. It can't be explained. And he just says, this is what you can have in the midst of this. You can conquer fear by not vanquishing it, but rather by moving ahead, uh, moving ahead in spite of it. There was a poll done uh, just a few months ago by the McLaughlin Group, and they polled thousands of, of, of you know, adults around the world, all kind of people, uh, believers, non-believers. And here's what they found out. Forty-four percent of those that responded to the survey said they believe that COVID is a way that God's trying to get people's attention to turn back to him. And I thought that was a fascinating number. Uh, so that, that there, there's an awareness that, that faith is is the answer or an answer, or certainly it is a, uh, a response that we should have, but we know biblically how important that is. I mean, that, that Matthew 10 says this, Jesus says this. Um, he says, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body, or in this case, or, or a disease that would want to kill your body. Now again, that doesn't mean don't be wise and smart and do the things that you should do. You know, I believe in science, I've got a degree in chemistry, so I, I, get, I get science. But don't be afraid in the sense that it's irrational, it paralyzes you from keeping moving forward in your life. They cannot touch your soul. There is this inside of us that can't be harmed by COVID or any other person. Fear only God who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And those are for people who have rejected him and said, I don't, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to, I don't want a relationship with you, which means separation from him. And that's what this place called hell is all about. So that's the first thing, conquering faith and fear, and there's a, there's a battle going on in all of our hearts. Uh, but greater, greater is the one within us than any fear that we'll face. Here's the second one. Expose deceptions with the truth of God's word. There, is a, there are a thousand deceptions, uh, myths, truths, half-truths, lies, half-lies that are out there. And the only way you can really have a, a way to attack these or, or, or come against them is to, is to know God's word. Just to know some basic principles about who Jesus is. I have found this, the number one place that people who are opposed to Christ, it is on the person of Christ that you have to focus in. And if, you, if you camp out around who Jesus is, Jesus the Son of God, is the, Christ, is the cross alone enough to save a person, you'll, you'll sort through a lot of these deceptions. If a person puts themselves up to be a Christ or a Messiah, that's a clear indication. And so, so what Scripture and Jesus said, don't follow them, don't. First of all, you got to know who they are and what they do, and so you got to know Scripture. Satan will come as an angel of light. Now, we're about to have Halloween, and people are going to dress up as devils, and they're going to put a pitchfork and horns and a tail. It's a cartoon version of Satan. Satan comes as an angel of light, is what the Bible says. He looks really attractive, and he looks really good, and he sounds really true, 
And there'll be some, always some truth mixed in there, but you have to know the deception. He's a, a, a trickster, a liar, a con man. He has that ability to people, pull people into things or, or to tempt them with things that, that will draw them in. So what does the scripture do for us? We'll look at First Timothy, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is inspired by God. It's useful for teaching the faith and correcting, there it is, correcting errors. If I ever say anything up here that is not biblical, please tell me, okay? I expect you to be checking me, okay? Because we're, we're trying to rightly divide the truth, and I won't 100% get it right. But, but it says it's also good for what? For, re, for resetting the direction of a man or a woman's life and training him or her in good living. It's a reset, right? Don't we need a reset sometimes? We get so filled with this stuff, and we go, let's, let's go get to God's Word. That's why this time is so important. That's why being in a Bible study where you're being prayed for and prayed over is so very important. And read John chapter 10 sometime today. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow my voice, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. It's a wonderful uh, scripture about assurance of salvation. Here's the third one. Be ready for, and and this is what I say to you. How should you live in these times? Just be ready for whenever, okay? Just be ready for whenever. You know, some are like, well, I'll be ready when. No, no, just be ready whenever, okay? If he were to come today, are you ready? You know, you know, first of all, have you trusted Christ? Have you asked him in your life? Have you, have you, are you a follower of Christ and, and received the grace that comes from him and forgiveness? And secondly, are you living in such a way that, you know, that, that, that you're living in these, we're living these last days. And so I want to live in a way that matters. I don't want to, I don't have people I've not forgiven. I don't want to have accounts of, 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 of relationships that I've neglected. I don't want to not say things that I need to say about who I love and, and how much I care for them. Be ready for whenever Jesus returns. And this is the emphasis of Jesus' teachings. And he kind of comes down on people who want to live by signs because he says, you just want these signs so you don't have to trust me. Look at Matthew 24, 44. Therefore, he says, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And so you you shouldn't have to do this thing of, I'm going to only be ready when I expect him. Be ready for him anytime he comes because that's how we should live every day. And the question just comes, are you ready for Christ's return? Here's the last question, or the last uh, kind of category. You know, there's, there's truth, and there's faith, and there's readiness and faithfulness. And here's the last part, is that we ought to be a witness to the hope that we have in Christ. We are, we are surrounded by people who are desperately crying out for hope. They want to know that there's something more than all this bad stuff that's out there. I, I read just, I haven't read much of it, but I read a little bit of a book called The Power of Bad. Anybody read the book The Power of Bad? It, it's pretty interesting. You can see it on Amazon, but The Power of Bad is about a guy named Michael, uh, David Tierney, I think is his name. But he basically, the, he's just a psychologist, but here's what he says. There is an inherent driving force within negativity that's more powerful, at least initially, not, not eventually, but initially the bad, the negative is more powerful than the positive. And so that explains why a lot of what we hear today, whether it's internet or it's media or it's t- you know, whatever it is, even conversations, they focus on the bad because the bad has a natural drive and it gets our attention. The, 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 the power of a neg- this negativity sort of feeds on itself and it draws people in and so we can be caught up in this. And so we ought to be people that have hope. And it's not just kind of a, a mindless hope, but it's a sense of, it's a realistic hope. I understand what's going on, but my hope isn't in this world or this world system. My hope is not in a person or a politician. My hope is not in a government or a program. My hope is in Christ and Christ alone. And, and so I'm going to have, and so we, we have this hope in us. And so Jesus would come to them and say this, look at, look at chapter, uh, Luke 21, 13, it says, And so you will bear testimony to me. In other words, how you respond to all this uncertainty, all these, you know, we we use that word over and over, unprecedented time. You're going to show people hope or or you're not. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves or or, or provide for yourselves or or cope with it. For I will give you words and wisdom and that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. God will provide what you need. We prepare our hearts, but we don't have to just sit up all night worrying about what we're going to do after we've done what God wants us to do because of that. And and look at this verse out of Revelation 12. I've used this verse over and over, but it reminds me, and this is verse 11. And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb. This is a verse about the end end of the age, talking about the faithful believers who overcame 
Uh, it says they overcame the, the enemy of the devil. And they, they defeated him or overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, what Christ has done for me. And they did not love their lives so much as to be afraid to, to die. And to have believers that would stand for Christ and say, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm invested in my life and I'm going to live every day for the fullest. But I also understand that there are things more important in this life. And, and I want to live with that understanding as well. Here's the last thing I share with you is this, the ultimate sign is the resurrection of Christ. You know, there, there have been no but greater sign than that Christ has a plan and that God has the power to raise us from the dead than the, the fact that he rose Christ from the dead who bore our sin upon himself. And so Jesus says it again. He says this in Matthew 12. He says, he answered, a wicked and adulterous generation, they ask for a sign. Even people who don't have faith, they, li they like to know if they're signs because they, they think they'll be helpful, and they can be, but not apart from faith. So he says, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So I'll give you the best sign you could ever have. And that is the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was in three days and three, three nights in the bell, belly of a huge fish. Remember, that's not a whale. In case people think it's a whale, it's, it's, the Bible says huge fish. So that the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then he'll rise from the dead. And that resurrection shows once and for all that he is who he said he was. No other leader has ever done that. So here's what I want you to do. We come to a time of a message like this, it's, it, 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 it ought to cause us, of course, we're, we're, we have thoughts about the future, but it ought to really focus us on this moment right now. So let me ask you to bow your heads. In the midst of all that's going on in your mind right now, all the things you're going to have to do today or this week or what you're thinking about, can, I'm going to ask you to focus in on this. And that is simply this. If you are a believer, if you are a follower of Christ, are you looking forward to the return of Christ? Are you looking forward to that? And I don't mean, of course, we, we love our families, and of course, we, we are invested in what we're doing. But do you understand that there will never be a final, um, uh, you know, blessing or final grace on this world until one day Christ comes to establish his kingdom in fully? And it may not be in our lifetimes. But, but are, you, are, you, are you anticipating and expecting the fact that one day there's going to be this place and this time when all things are made right that are wrong? when every sin will be removed, when every pain will be taken care of, when every person will be healed, that's going to be an incredible day. And we'll leave it to him to, to get, tell us when that's going to happen or when's the best time for that to happen. But, but, but would, you, would you just say, Father, forgive me for the times that I've been so caught up in my world that I've not, my kingdom, that I've, that I've not longed for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. So for believers, that's the first place we start. And then to be a witness of hope to those around you. God wants to use you as, as a light in darkness, as, as salt and light to people who are longing. And can I just say one last word as we're maybe to somebody online or maybe somebody here. If you've never trusted Christ, today's the day to do that. Don't put that off. Don't wait. You've been given so many warnings and signs. You know that, this, that, that the answer is found in a relationship with Christ, and you can receive that today with a simple prayer. So let's pray together. And if you're here today with that Christ, you can just pray a simple prayer. says, Dear Jesus, would you forgive me my sin? I want to receive Christ and his forgiveness. I want to become a new person in him. And I give my life to you today. Father, thank you for those who have prayed that prayer and some online that have done that or will do that. Father, for some that maybe have done that here. God, I thank you for that. I know that simple faith is what you desire. Faith that a child has to trust their dad. A faith that a child has to believe that there's more than they can see with their eyes that matters. God, I thank you for the love that we've found in Christ and how it's transformed us. Father, I pray and I ask you in these days that we might be those who are witnesses to the hope we found in Christ. God, that we might be those who will be a light that's shining in the darkness. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before we get out of here, let me do a couple things. If you'll take out your if connection card, if any of you have those out of the, um, of the program today, I just want to remind you, if you'll fill this out and place your name on it, that'd be very helpful. Uh, we just want to know you're here. We probably have your information. If not, an address or a phone number or email is very helpful. Uh, we have an email uh, newsletter that goes out we'd like to share with you. And then just a couple quick announcements. Um, we, have, we, we have you for years now sponsored the Nimitz football team. How many of you have sponsored a player in days past? A bunch of you have. We need six more. Is that right? Uh, down to four. It's like an auction, a reverse auction. Uh, we, do I hear four? We have four in the, uh, players that need sponsors. 
And so you just get them a bag each week and you bring it here to the church. And, but Linda will be back there at a table after the service in the commons and uh, she can get you signed up and be a great ministry and a great way to reach out to these young men. Uh, we have a drive through fall festival this year. It's going to be exciting. We're going we're to register lots of folks. We're going to give away a lot of great stuff. We're going to have a lot of fun. Um, uh, I think Jack's already signed up for a two-hour duty in the dunking booth. We're going to have a dunking booth just tied to a rope, and if the car drives by, we pull the rope. So that's the way we're going to do it. Just the exhaust will set off the, the, the But um, we're going to have a lot of fun. There, inside that program, there's an a orange sign-up sheet. If you, if you can help us work, we need lots of folks. We hope to have two, three, four hundred cars at night and um, be a little different than we've done. And then I um, want to uh, just tell you a little bit about the Homeview Center. I know some of you are familiar with it. It's back there in the back. My, uh, my lovely wife, Tasha, will be back there after the service. Um, she's right over here waving. Uh, but the Homeview Center is just a resource center to encourage families and single parents and, and couples who are married. And there's stuff for all stage, stages of life. And so if, if uh, there's the center section, it's all free. There's devotional books there. Uh, there for, you know, for single family, for family who is uh, as a single, for a person who is a single parent. There are resources in the middle. On the left, there are books you can buy. On the right, there's display items for resources that you might want to get yourself later. So we encourage you to stop by there. We'll again, as we have, uh, dismiss by Rose, and we encourage you uh, with your giving as well as with your uh, connection cards to place them in the generosity box on the way back, on the way out, okay? Joey? As we leave this morning, it is a comforting thought to think about how we have nothing to fear as Christ followers, as believers. We don't. And sometimes fear creeps in and starts to convince us that we can't speak out. But the Lord Jesus is moving in, the, in this world and drawing other people to Him. And we have an opportunity to be salt and light now as we leave for his name so let's sing this together as we decide again to be his people